The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next on Life Today, award-winning composer and broadcast personality John Tesh openly shares his journey through a rare form of cancer. And I finally was out of options when they when they got to the point where they wanted to firebomb my pelvis with uh, carpet bomb, as they called it, with uh, 57 treatments uh, of radiation. And and uh, an amazing amount of revelation and faith was born. And we stood on Mark 11:23, and uh, two years later, there's not a trace of cancer in my body. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Sheila is with me as always. And it's great to have you guys here because we have a guest that is going to give you some hope today. I talked to John Tesh a few weeks ago on Life Today Live, which is online on our social media platforms. And I was like, you know, everybody needs to hear this. Everybody watching television needs to hear this. He's got a book called Relentless. And it's about not giving up. And I know this has been a tough year for a lot of people. A lot of years are tough for a lot of people, but especially this one. We need some encouragement to just keep going, to have some hope. And so John Tesh is here. John, how are you doing out there? I'm well. I'm healed. I'm whole. And I'm in my basement, so I'm good. Okay. Now, when you say you're healed, you're whole, uh, people that don't know what you've been through might wonder what that means. You Tell us how you're doing and how you've fought. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in 2015, I went to the doctor for <clears throat> a routine uh, exam, you know, and um, he found uh, the most aggressive form of prostate cancer that he'd ever seen before. And this was, it, could, it didn't show up in my blood, I didn't have any symptoms or whatever. It was a rare form of non PSA producing prostate cancer. And so that exam led to another exam and then to a biopsy. And then within about a week, I was given 18 months to two years to live. This was in May of 2015. Wow. And uh, yeah, and so it was literally the tablecloth being pulled out and, and all of the silverware going everywhere. I I mean, it was just our our lives. My wife, Connie, Connie Selica, and our kids and grandkids. It was just it was just everybody just stopped. It was like, what, what happened? And so uh, we, you know, we're connected to some some good uh, like you guys, right? We're connected some, to, to some good hospitals and some good doctors. And so we made a bunch of phone calls, did a bunch of research, and and that ended up being two major surgeries, bone biopsies, chemotherapy, uh, and it was uh, yeah, we could probably give you two years to live at the at the outset, but that's a, that's about it. And so that journey lasted for about three years. And during that period of time, uh, somebody handed me a, a, a CD of somebody you know, uh, Andrew Womack, who is a, t a Bible teacher out in uh, in Woodland Park, Colorado. And it was it, the the message was basically all about Mark eleven twenty three. So in the middle of this of, of this journey, I had faith for the doctors. And if I hadn't, I'd be dead. But uh, in the middle of that, when the cancer kept coming back, every time I'd get a test, three months later, four months later, they'd find another lymph node and it lit up. And and I finally was out of options when they when they got to the point where they wanted to firebomb my pelvis with uh, carpet bomb, as they called it, with uh, 57 treatments uh, of radiation, they went through the list of contraindications of all the different, I, I might lose this function, that function. And when they got to the functions that I really wanted to keep, I, I had, a, I had a, a, a look with my wife at that point and, and uh, an amazing amount of revelation and faith was born. And we stood on Mark 11:23, 23. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, there's not a trace of cancer in my body. That's the real short story. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, as you know, the, uh, the, 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 the grueling uh, uh, specifics are in that book. For those, John, who might not know what Mark 11, 23 is, what is that scripture? Um, you can read it on my arm. It's right here tattooed on my arm. Oh, wow. It's uh, now it's whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt, but believes that what he says will be done, shall have whatever he says. It's basically Jesus, Jesus talking and and talking about the fact that uh, you will with faith filled words have what you say. And so I grew up in the Methodist church and in way back, I was born in 1952 and my dad ran the church, I had two, two uncles that were Baptist preachers and nobody really taught me that when Jesus went to the cross, he not only took 
our sins and it was worth salvation, but he also took our griefs, our sorrows and our, and our sicknesses. And, and until I got to that revelation, my wife and I both, and then got to Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I was begging, I thought that God had put this sickness on me. I thought that I had given myself the sickness. My, in fact, I still believe that because when I was 63, I was diagnosed. And my dad at 63 years old, same year in his life, he died from, from, uh, from cancer. So I, I'm sure that my worry and, and uh, helped to manifest that in my life. Mm. When I read um, this book, Relentless, which is amazing, it was, even though I've known of you and I've loved your music for so many years, I had no idea that you went through so much rough stuff as a young guy. Um, could you just give us the kind of like cliff notes of how you got to where you got to? <laughs> Well, if you're familiar with the story of Hernan Cortez burning his ships so that, so that his uh, so that his men would take the island and they wouldn't they wouldn't mutiny, I I, I bur I've burned my ships a couple of times in my in my lifetime, and, and most of the things that happened to me, I guess it's like this with a lot of people, it was self-inflicted. And the uh, and the story <laughs> the story that everybody loves is when I was 19, I tried to change my my major in college from textile chemistry. My dad was a, a vice president at Hanes Underwear, and he wanted me to follow in his footsteps. So I wanted to be a performer my whole life I had you know, musical training and theater training and all that and so my dad sent me to school to, to study textile chemistry I lasted about five or six semesters and then I wanted to change my major without telling him uh, and without uh, permission from one of my professors and so this is this I'm shortening the story it's, it's gonna sound even worse <laughs> I, I, I took a leap of faith and I signed my professor's name to the drop ad card to try and drop a, what my statistics course and he checked in a, in, a, in a room of 120 kids, lecture hall, he checked and then filed a grievance against me. And at, at uh, 19 and a half, 20 years old, um, the university asked me to leave. They suspended me indefinitely, said I had broken the honor code, which I had. And then my dad, a very honorable World War II veteran, he, uh, he threw me out of the house saying I was no longer welcome in his, in his house. So, and then my girlfriend broke up with me. So I was, <laughs> yeah, I shot myself in both feet. Um, <laughs> And so I ended up in a tent for like six months in Raleigh, North Carolina, pumping gas and working construction. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, I mean, it's like, like a lot, well, the way a lot of people have felt recently, right, being quarantined, I, that, that was the way it felt for me, except that everybody else was not quarantined. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're in that, that tent, because that, I mean, it's a nice picture of your lowest point in life. It's kind of like, you know, I've tried to do things my own way and it's not working out and look where it's got me. It's a little bit, little bit of a prodigal son kind of story. What was it that you thought and then did to get yourself out of that situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I had no money. I was I was making some money pumping gas at College SO and working construction. And, you know, I was like a farmer. I, I woke up at first light to, to work construction. I went to bed at uh, night. I, no, I had like a little Coleman lantern and I, I ate hot dogs mostly. <laughs> so, uh, which is all I could uh, could afford. But uh, I realized that I, I liked the media. I liked radio. I'd gotten bitten by that bug. I took a radio course while I was in, in, in school trying to raise my GPA. And so I thought, well, maybe I can get a job at a radio station. <laughs> and so nice. I found a way to break into the campus radio station. And since I was already a criminal, I figured, what the heck, I'm just a repeat <laughs> offender. You know, how much more time can they give me in the tent? <laughs> So I got into the campus radio station. A friend of mine let me in, and and I made a fake uh, radio broadcast. And I needed a demo tape, right? right. And so I went in there, and there was a piano in front of me. So I played a little bit of piano, of course, and and also there was a microphone, and there was a, a, a an electric uh, manual, sorry, manual typewriter, um, and I and I and I held my nose and did all the all the actualities. It's like I was like, this is John Tesh, WKIX 2020 News. I switch you live now to Maurice Gindy and Kyle. This is Maurice Gindy and Kyle. And I did that. <laughs> I did the helicopter traffic report. Oh, the I-40 is just jammed right now, John. Back to you in the studio, and I did the sports report, you know. And and, uh, and I took this reel-to-reel -reel tape, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. And I, I took it to a radio station. The guy called me on my payphone, which was next to the tent, and said, did you do all these noises and all this stuff on this tape? It was like a 15-minute demo. And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, well, if you want a job that badly, I'll give you a job running the religious tapes at Sunday mo on Sunday morning from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. on WKIX. <laughs> and you know how it happens. You get your foot in the door, somebody leaves, whatever. And so the most bizarre thing, and this is how I always say this on the concert, this is how I know there's a Holy Spirit. Within 36 months of me being in that tent, I had five different jobs, and I was anchoring the news at WCBS TV in New York City in the same building as Walter Cronkite. Wow! So yeah, you figure it out. <laughs> wow! Wow! 
Well, okay, so your book is titled Relentless, and obviously you've sort of had that in you. What do you say to other people who are having a hard time you're just looking at circumstances, looking at their yeah. situations, and thinking, I, I, how am I going to do what this guy did, right? Yeah, and it's and listen, I'm not the sunny guy every morning when I wake up, you know. But but what I what I realize, and 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 you know, it's interesting. Journaling is really it's it's a great time to be journaling, and and this is the ultimate journal when you write a book that's you know eighty thousand words. Uh, and when I look back on my life, I realized a couple of things. One was that whenever good things happened to me, I was working a process, and 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 the process was something that my my band teacher taught me when I was seven years old, which was which was persistence and grit and faith, but also risk, always taking risks. And he said, you have to fall in love with the with with the process and not think about the the goal. And so here we are because, you know, we've been going through now this the, the, this time when we've been quarantined and so many people are not even sure what they may have a new goal and not sure what it is. But if you keep working the process, you know, where it's almost like what the Navy SEALs do, you know, uh, General, uh, I mean, Admiral, Admiral McRaven, who led the Navy SEALs for, for years, trained them in, 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 the, in California. He always he has a great book out called Make Your Bed. You know, and it's it's one of those things where you, you have to have a win every morning. And so from my process is I'm up at 430. I'm working out for an hour every single day. And even, even if I just don't do anything, I'm walking in circles. I, you know, I call I'll call it a workout. But having that process and having that routine is was it was really when there was any any success for me. That's I look back and I saw that that was working that same process. I wonder, John, reading through some of your story and and knowing what a huge impact Connie has also been in your life in terms of faith and how is your relationship with Christ this side of cancer different than yeah. it was before you yeah. walked into that yeah uh, it's, it's an amazing the, the part of the book as you, as you know is an amazing love story because she just dropped everything you know my wife is a famous actress and a grandmother and mother of two and, and just to, you know we've been married for 28 years and she she just stopped everything and became my advocate but the other thing that happened for us was that we became equally yoked in our belief that God wants Want, wanted me well, that God didn't put the sickness on me, that God's true nature was healing, that uh, that, that there really was something in in, in 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes you were healed, uh, and Isaiah 53, and Isaiah 54, no weapon against you shall, shall shall prosper. So we were, we we believed together and we prayed together with that with that understanding. And if, I mean, it's easy for me to say, but it's the truth that, that if I hadn't had Connie Conchetta uh, in in my life, I, I I wouldn't have made it because there were many times, and there's one I mentioned in the book where I would look at the, these kettlebells in the you know in the backyard next to the pool and just say, let me just strap these to my ankles and and, uh, and jump in the pool just because after a while the suffering is it just wears you down and I know that people many people have been suffering now we talk about the healthcare workers and, you know and and nurses and the doctors and just just that, that the relentless pursuit of that disease it just creates an enormous amount of suffering and and so I'm very familiar with that at my own level wow powerful well for those who uh, are facing that sort of suffering was there any one particular thing when you were at that low, low point uh, that really just brought you out that you could share? Cat videos. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> well, laughter is a good medicine, so I actually... It really is. It really is. I mean, I, I would go on YouTube and I'd watch, like, you know, old Conan O'Brien episodes and stuff like that. I mean, you know, uh, Michael Jr., who's this great Christian comedian. Oh, yeah. um, it, it it helps. But, but, but just really... You know, there's a big difference, as you guys know, there's a big difference between having faith and, and, and having too much unbelief. And that was the thing that I really concentrated on was renewing my mind. I kept myself away from reading about cancer. I kept myself away from, from seeing anything negative or talking to anybody at a dinner party who wants to say, oh, or how are you? You know, those kind of, those kind of people where I, I worked as hard on getting the unbelief out of my, out of my head, right, um, as I did on having faith that God wanted me well. I think that's actually a huge point because I think even during this COVID-19 crisis, I think what's bringing a lot of people down is the endless news coverage, the, you know, the updates every day, the, the kind of negative proclamations. 
I think that what you have learned in your cancer struggle is very pertinent to what we are facing right now. Yeah, yeah, you really said it well. I mean, there's there's a, there's a friend of ours, Dr. David Katz, who's the head of the Yale Prevention Medicine Center in, uh, in, in New Haven, and he talks about how you really need to, one of his big prescriptions is you need to concentrate on looking away every now and then, you know, and and uh, you have to be careful what you let in there because every if, even if you see the same news, we know this, you know, even if you see the same news report five times, it registers as five different events. And, and, and so, yeah, looking away and even what I do is I read the news. I, I, you know, I grew up in local news and net, network news. And I, I know that when it, when it bleeds, it leads. You know, that's yeah. really the way those decisions are made. And you have to be real. You have to titrate what's getting in here. Yeah. So good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a firm believer that a lot of times, you know, because we don't, we all die at some point. But a lot of times when we face sickness, God's got a purpose in it, and it's not to destroy us, but it's because he has something he's called us to do that we haven't completed yet. So we still have this, this mission Amen. in life. Amen. And Amen. one of the things I noticed that you do is your Intelligence for Life radio program. Um, and then, of course, there's family. I'm sure there's a lot of things on your plate, but what is it that you think God has called you to do that John Tesh has not yet accomplished? To speak in a secular world, you know, I mean, I love, we're like-minded. I love, I love having these conversations, but you know, I've, you know, I've been on, on uh, Fox News with Fox and Friends and, and with Martha McCallum and you know, Hannity and all those guys. And, and, you know, when you bring up something like this, when you bring up divine healing, which is what we're talking about, of course, it's, it's amazing how you can almost see it in their eyes. They're like, <laughs> I'm really glad you, I can't bring it up, John, but I'm really glad you brought it up, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's really where we play 30 concerts a year in secular venues but but the last 12 minutes of that is me telling my story and showing pictures of me you know during during chemo and telling the stories about mark 11 23 and we were even pbs specials coming out in june and and that scripture is right there behind me because it's a testimony i'm not a preacher uh i'm not a pastor but i do have that healing testimony which which a lot of people take as being powerful yeah, and one of the things during this whole time that I'm finding really powerful is every single morning, my husband and I will go out on our balcony and we will read a psalm out loud. There's yeah. something so great about your ears hearing what your eyes are yeah, reading because yeah, yeah, there's power yeah. in the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, that's so important because, it, and really th that it comes out of your mouth because you guys probably know Dr. Caroline Leaf, you know, neuro neurologist, and she, and she she studies, you know, what 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 words, the impact that words have at the subatomic level in your, you know, in, in your body wow. and the, uh, you know, down, down all the way past the, you know, the blood and the corpuscles and the veins and the vessels, you know, but all, all the way into the waves that are there in your body. So again, you, you will have what you say. And one of the great Psalms for me is Psalm 118, you know, you will, you, you will not, not die, but live and declare the works of the, of the Lord. I mean, I would, that you would, you could walk into my house anytime when I was sick and you would hear me yelling that out. Wow. That's wow. beautiful. That is wow. powerful. Yeah. You know, there's a few people I think that are watching this show right now that are just on the edge. They're like, I wish I had that faith. I wish I could keep going like, like this guy did. Just address that person right now who's right there on the edge, but they're just struggling with the, being relentless and, and really having the, the faith that God wants them to have. What yeah. would you say to them? Here's, here's, the, here's the good news. I'm closing in on being on 68 years old. I've done the work for you. I've done the work for you. I have literally tried everything. I've tried forging a professor's signature. I've, uh, I've I went through one failed marriage. I've been uh, I was you know in New York City drinking too much, doing drugs while I was still doing the news. And I, I tried I tried that. I tried blaming God. I tried begging God. And when I finally got to what the promise was already in the Bible, and here's the metaphor that you can that you can use. The analogy is that you know. The power company comes and they hook up all the power, the electricity to your house. They don't come in and turn on all the lights for you. That's your job. You got to do that. So the power is there. It's ready for us. Mm. Holy Spirit is power will come upon you. All you have to do is just reach out and say, OK, I understand this was done for me. When Jesus went to the cross, he did this for me. And, and, and to, to beg him would would it, it doesn't make any sense that you would do that. Just receive it. And that's and again. If it works, if it worked for me, it can work for you. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's encouraging. Yeah, that is really powerful. And one of the things that you know we here care very much about is being able to get some real help to some real people in Jesus' name. And one of the practical things that we are doing at the moment is we have a commitment um, for 350 water wells. 
I want you to watch this and then we'll come back and let you know how you can get a hold of John's book. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's a tenet of our faith. But as a believer, I can tell you, I view my hope with a new perspective when I encounter people who have lost what they hold sacred, their children. I want you to understand something about the, the people here. Um, they tend to have quite a few children, up to seven in some of the families uh, in some of these villages we've, we've seen. And they typically will not all grow to, into adulthood. They'll lose them and they're losing them the same way. One of the most profound lessons I've learned from my parents is that we are blessed to be a blessing. At Life Today, we find people around the world in desperate need of a blessing. Many of them lack one of life's most basic needs. To you and me, this is just dirty water. But to countless people around the world, this is the only source of water, the only thing they have to drink. And for far too many, this is death. Life and death, it could not be simpler. Our hope in Christ challenges us to fight for life. And in this case, our path is clear. This water is clean. It's drinkable. It's beautiful. It's nothing like the water we've seen around the world in places where children especially are dying of waterborne diseases. When you give this clean, pure water, you give them a chance at life. Let's give water for life. You know, it's so, the difficult part about that for me is when you go to these places, the water is, is really bad. I mean, you look at that and my Western mind says, okay, boil it or filter it or do something. Believe me, when they have those options, they are. But in so many circumstances, they just don't have a choice. It's the only thing they can drink. And so they drink it. And you know, we'll walk up in these cases sometimes and we'll see them dip it and then they'll take a drink and you wanna reach out and go, ah, stop, don't drink that, don't drink that. But that's what they do every day. They just don't have a choice. The water is there. God's put it there in the ground. It's just a matter of accessing it. That's why we're here drilling water wells. That's what we're asking you to do to join us. It's, to me, it's kind of like the gospel. The gospel is there for everyone. But how will they know if they don't hear it? Well, the water's there, but how will they get it if we don't help them? And that's, Sheila, why I look at this and go, Major problem, easy fix, and we are the solution. I know, I, and absolutely, Randy, as long as you and I, as the body of Christ, are on the planet at this moment, we can make a difference. It's one of the things I love about James and Betty, about their vision. They will find out what, what's going on in the world, who is God using to fix it, and how can we underwrite that and help them? And so many of you have done that through the years, this sweet, lovely lady wrote to me the other day and she said I put in one water well last year and I'm going to do it again this mm. year. That's amazing. That's $4,800 will actually put a well in a village that will last for a lifetime. And I've been to the villages where the water is filthy. There's no access to clean water and children are dying. It's like playing Russian roulette with your children's lives every day and you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But in the villages where there's a well and I, and I, I mean I couldn't contain myself when I I saw given by the Partners of Life Outreach International. I mean, I just did a happy dance. You've helped us do it. We're asking, will you help us to do it again? And there's a level you can all come in. $48 will provide 10 people with clean, fresh water for life. $144 will give 30 people clean water for life. Now, if you're able to do a whole well, I mean, what a legacy to leave, to be able to say somewhere across the world, uh, we've been able to put a water in that gives a whole village clean water. So please, will you do it now? Will you go to your phone, dial that number on your screen and give the very best gift possible. Together, let's bring water for life in Jesus' name. Go to your phone, make the best gift you can. 
dirty, disease-filled water. How desperate would a mother need to be to consider giving this contaminated substance to her child? For many mothers and their families living in extreme poverty, this is their only choice. With your help, they won't have to make this choice ever again. Mission Water for Life provides clean, disease-free water for thousands of children and their families, giving them a life free from the fear of death. With your gift today, you can help drill and establish the final 150 water wells this year. Your gift of $48 will help provide water for 10 people. $72 will provide for 15. $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. And a gift of $4,800 will help sponsor a complete well, serving up to 1,000 people. With your gift, we'll send you Today is a Good Day seasonal devotional set. Broken out into the four seasons of the year, this beautiful set features a daily scripture, inspirational thoughts, and a place for you to journal your own thoughts, prayers, and insights from God's Word. With your gift of $100 or more, request the leather-bound, life-giving Proverbs Journal, filled with wisdom and daily encouragement from Proverbs, including lined pages for your personal notes. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well. And you may request a Mother's Strength bronze sculpture. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Randy, Sheila, I travel all over the world as the Director of Missions for Life Today. I continue to hear some of the same stories. Death, why? simply because they don't have clean drinking water. These mothers who wanted to give life to her children, she wanted to bring health to her family by bringing water home, but she ends up bringing contaminated water, if she can find any, and it brings death to her children. I beg you as parents, I'm a parent myself, help our viewers understand none of us want to bring death into our home. None of us want to bring contaminated water to our children. We want to bring water that's going to give them life. Please help our viewers know that they can give and be an answer to a mother's cry. I need your help today. I hope you'll do what you can to help us reach that goal. In fact, I want to surpass that goal because the reality is the more of you that respond, the bigger that you respond, there's more that we can do and we're happy to do it. Everything's in place to do it. So thank you as you, as you support water for life and i also want to thank sheila our guest today and we've got a nice get, uh, gift for people that will support yeah for any um gift at all we will send you john's book relentless unleashing a life of purpose grit mm -hmm. and faith so john, thank you so, so much for being with us god bless you give our love to connie and keep going strong brother it was my pleasure thanks so much and thank all of you for watching join us next time on life today That's the pounding question of so much as where is a good God in a broken-hearted, suffering world? And Voskamp joins Sheila Walsh tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.